Hello YouTube and welcome to Network Playroom. Now in this video we're going to talk about the OSPF designated router and backup desi designated router. To fully understand why the designated router and backup designated router are needed, let's look at how OSPF would form adjacencies in a multi-access network. And this is exactly what I've drawn on the screen here. Now in a broadcast network of five routers, there would be 10 adjacencies between the routers. This is what I've depicted on the screen here. So these five routers would have to form these 10 adjacencies. So there's actually a formula to calculate this. And it is for n number of routers, the number of adjacencies is n times n minus one divided by two. Uh, let me write that down here. So n times n minus one divided by two. So in, in our case, it's five times five minus one divided by two, which is 10. And similarly, uh, for 10 routers, there would be 45 adjacencies. So that would be 10 times 10 minus 1 divided by 2. Oops. And that's 45. Isn't that crazy? So you can see the number of adjacencies quickly goes up as more routers are added to the network. So the problem is that each router would flood LSAs to each adjacent router, which means there would be several copies of the same LSAs circulating in the network. Now this is unnecessary and a waste of resources. So you would have LSAs going here here, you know, all the way around, you get the picture. So here's where the designated router comes in. So the designated router has two jobs. One, to represent the multi-axis network and its attached routers to the rest of the OSPF area. And two, to manage the flooding process on the network. So the concept behind the DR is that the broadcast link itself is considered a pseudo node or a virtual router. And when the shortest path, no, sorry. When the shortest path three is calculated, the link appears as a node and the routers attached to the link are attached to that node. So the cost from the attached router to the pseudo node is the outgoing cost of that router's interface to the broadcast link, but the cost from the pseudo node to any attached router is zero. So this way the overall path cost is not affected by the pseudo node. So here's what it's gonna look like without these 10 adjacencies. And now I realize that this graph looks a little ridiculous since I've drawn these arrows here. So let me just wipe those away real quick. So yes. So one router is given the role of DR, which represents the pseudo node with a special network LSA. Now we haven't discussed the different types of LSAs yet, but that's something to keep in mind for later. So each router on the network forms an adjacency with the DR only. And note here that the DR is chosen per network segment. 
So a router might be the DR on one of its broadcast networks, but not for another. So in other words, the DR is a property of a router's interface and not the entire router. Now here in our scenario, I've marked R5 as the DR. So you can see in the image here or in the diagram here below that all the other routers are forming an adjacency only with R1. So that significantly decreases the number of adjacencies from 10 down to four. So what about what happens if the DR fails? Well, simply a new DR must be elected. However, new adjacencies would have to be established and all routers on the network would have to synchronize their databases with the new DR. And while all this is happening, the network is unavailable to transit packets. So to prevent this problem, a backup designated router is selected in addition to the designated router. So all routers form adjacencies not only with the DR, but also with the BDR. So the DR and the BDR also become adjacent with each other. And if the DR fails, the BDR becomes the new DR. And because the other routers on the network are already adjacent with the BDR, network unavailability is minimized. So let's say, for example, R4 is the BDR. So what would happen is that the other routers would form a relationship with the R4 as well. Now, actually, let me let me use a ruler for this one so I can make the lines a little bit nicer so you can see what it's going to look like. So now R2 has an adjacency with both the DR and the BDR. The same with R1. And finally with R3. There. That's how it would look like once the DR and the BDR are elected. So how exactly is the DR elected? So it is a multi-step process. And first, each router interface on the network has a router priority between 0 and 255. And the default priority on Cisco routers is 1. Let me just write that here as well. Default priority is one. So the router with the highest priority becomes the DR. And routers with a priority of zero are ineligible to become the DR or the BDR. And second, if the priority values are the same, which by default they are, the router with the highest router ID becomes the DR. So let's suppose that the router IDs for these routers are as such. Very pre predictable IDs. 4.4.4 for R4 and then 5.4. 5.5.5 for R5. So you would see that since this is the highest router ID, then R5 would naturally become the DR and R4 would become the BDR. Wow, I can't draw a nice circle. 
there we go. Good enough. Okay, so now note that this is if a DR has not already been elected. And let me explain. The priority can influence an election, but it will not override an active DR or BDR. That is, if a router with a higher priority becomes active after a DR and BDR have been elected, the new router will not replace either of them. So the first two eligible routers to initialize on a multi-access network will become the DR and the BDR. So for example, let's say that uh, R5 failed. And then five minutes later, it came back online. So it would have the highest router ID, but it would not become the DR again. Router 4 would have overtaken its role as the DR and a new BDR would have been elected. In this case, it would have been R3. So um, next, the DR and BDR actually have a special address. So the quote-unquote normal OSPF multicast address is 224.0.0.5, also called the OSPF router's address. So let me see, let's write it down here, 224.0.0.5, all SPF routers. Wow, it's getting crowded here. Uh, but the DR and BDR listen to a special all routers address 224.0.0.6. 224.0.0.6. And it's called all routers. So after the DR and BDR have been elected, the other routers, also known as druthers, will establish adjacencies with the DR and BDR only and remain in the two-way state with the other routers. So if you remember from my previous video, we looked at the OSPF neighbor states and I explained that the two stable t states are the two-way and full state. So the routers would be in the full state with the DR and BDR and in the two-way state with the other routers. So when the druthers want to communicate with the DR slash BDR, they use 224.0.0.6, but the DR slash BDR uses 224.0.0.5 to send packets to druthers. And note that if only one eligible router is attached to a multi-access network, that router will become the DR and there will be no BDR. And any other routers will form adjacencies only with the DR. And if none of the routers are attached Sorry, if none of the routers attached to the multi-access network are eligible, there will be no DR or BDR and no adjacencies will form. Okay, but that's really it about the OSPF designated router and backup designated router. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.